<laughs> Good morning. Okay. Should I start over? Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, well, let's just take two. I'm Morgane. I am the chairperson of the Coracle Committee and the vice president of the Sisterhood of Avalon. Uh, the Coracle is the online, ongoing educational platform of the Sisterhood of Avalon. After a brief hiatus, um, we have come back and will be coming back strong over the next few months. And I can't think of a better way to restart the Coracle than to speak with Christopher Hughes. Most everyone in the Sisterhood, I would think, is um, familiar with Christopher. He is the head of the Anglesey Jewett Order, a Jewett graduate of the Order of Bards, Ovates, and Druids. He's the award-winning author of several books that focus on Welsh mythology, magic, and druidry. Um, his latest book is the one that we're going to be talking about the most, which is the Book of Druidry, a complete introduction to the magic and wisdom of the Celtic mysteries. And we'll probably also touch on um, his first Druidry book, which we just um found out was published in 2007, and this one is called Natural Druidry. So um, without any further ado, I would love to introduce Christopher Hughes. And thank you so much, Christopher, for joining us on our first, first visit back to uh, the Coracle Live. You're more than welcome. It's always a pleasure and a joy. We've often been referred to um, Slightly tongue in cheek as the S O A D O. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and and I believe that I believe that. Um, <laughs> We've made many so connections today. over the years, which is just lovely. <laughs> it is. It is just lovely, and it's it's so nice to see you again. Uh, I think the last time we had you on Coracle was when you did your Caridon workshop in twenty twenty one, I believe. I believe um, so. Yes, yeah, time has flown longer, longer than we probably like to think. So, um, okay, once you get started, but first of all, and I hope I pronounce all this right. Please forgive me. I wanted to congratulate you on your recent induction into the Druids of the Orsef. Right? Yes, perfect. Natural, perfect. You said it perfectly. I step pod of Wales. I do that perfect again? you did okay. well done i i've tried to do, <laughs> yeah i've tried to do uh well sean duolingo because i'm doing portuguese and i looked i was like i can't do this <laughs> so <laughs> i i gave up i think within two days so <laughs> so i guess today we're here more for discussion i mean you've written so many books and we love them all and they've been so helpful and um you know, some of them, like one of our sisters, Maddie, was mentioning earlier, um, was a cauldron born and how it's just affected her in such a positive, positive, positive manner. But since your um, book of Georgia just came out, uh, I think I got mine last month. So everyone, this is it. It's available on Amazon, uh, published by Llewellyn. And um I have not quite finished it. Yes. <laughs> I've got the I've got the uncorrected proof. Oh, okay. I have got a real copy somewhere, but I'm not sure where. <laughs> I, I've got the real copy. So. You've got the real copy. Um, so I really would like to touch on, I know that there's quite mm. a few of us in the sisterhood who have studied, are studying, beginning to study Druidry. Um, it's just such a beautiful fit with the work that we do in, in the sisterhood. So I was flipping through it. I did write down a few questions. I think what I'd like to start with is for those not familiar with or versed in Druidry, what would be your simplest definition? I'm often asked that question. Sometimes they refer to it as the silver bullet pitch or the elevator pitch, you know, that you get in an elevator and there is somebody next to you who asks you what is druidry and you're only going up 10 floors <laughs> <laughs> and you have to do it in that time which of course is frightfully difficult especially when you consider that the the druid tradition in its many different guises spans such a vast period of time from the 
early period before the common era and well into the common era. But in a nutshell, I would define Druidry as an animistic, polytheistic community and tradition that has its foundations in the dissemination of wisdom and inspiration. So for the P-Celtic Druids, they might refer to that as the, the dissemination of Awen. And for the Q-Celts, they might dis, um, interpret that as Imas. And that essentially we see the world through the worldview of the Celtic cultural continuum. And, and the Druids, I guess, were the epitome of the Celtic culture of the Iron Age, but their influence can be seen and felt through all of the other different eras that the British Isles and Ireland have gone through. And we're still here today in that essentially a Druid is somebody who, um, just like the meaning of the name, the name or the title Druid means to know the oak or to be familiar with the oak. But there's also a connection between the word Dru, the first part of the word Druid, and the Sanskrit term Drush, which means door or in Welsh, Drus. So we can be seen as not only uh, people who bridge the gap between the human world and the world of plants and the world of trees, but also that we act as doorways to passages and corridors of wisdom. So I hope that what we do is strive to be oak wise and then disseminate that wisdom and that awen through our immediate vicinities and also into the wider world, uh, a process by which I flippantly refer to as a DTI or a Druid transmitted infection, uh, which is inspiration. And there's no ointment or unguent to get rid of it. Once you've caught inspiration, that's it. You've caught it. That's very funny. <laughs> so, all right. So we know just off the top of my head, there are the other I can come up with is there's your Druid order. There's Obad. Um, I know there's a couple of in the sisterhood studying with the Isle of Wight Druid order. I've found a Druid order in Galicia in uh, northern Spain and Portugal. So are they all the same? Are they all different? Are they all have slightly different paths? I'm 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 interested. So yeah, so I guess they will all be they'll all have something that will connect them fundamentally. And what I love in the Druid tradition is that usually there are there are various things or various elements that connect the different types of Druidries. And that Druidry is essentially is a wisdom tradition, right? So within that wisdom tradition, we have teachers who enable and assist us to discover the wisdom that is inherent in the natural world and also within the inner world of ourselves. And predominantly in Druidry, those teachers are identified as trees. And I love that the predominant symbol within the Druid tradition is that of a tree. Now, that's not necessarily unusual either, because if we look at the majority of world religions and also spirituality, somewhere along the line of their mythology, there's usually a tree. It's as if trees have always been speaking to human beings and teaching us something about not only the nature of nature, but also the nature of human nature being an integral part of nature. So I find that that the primary teachers within the Druid tradition that, that I work and I'm devoted to is that of a tree. But also we find that Druids are particularly in love with mythology, poetry and storytelling. And mythology, poetry and storytelling are very much cultural keys within the Celtic cultural continuum. And, and of course, language is a disseminator of culture. And here in Wales, because I'm, a, I'm a, a native Welsh person, my first language is Welsh, so I'm speaking to you in my second language. Uh, we, we are very much still in love with the function of poetry and storytelling as being that of the bard or the cyfarwydd, a person who would tell stories. And, and I love that not only do we have trees as primary teachers, but that we also have this history of the heart 
as expressed through mythology and poetry that enables us to find our wisdom and use that wisdom in the world to inspire it. So there's probably not a a succinct answer as to, you know, what is the one thing that unites all druids? I'd say it's a multiple of things and that it starts with trees and it moves to mythology and poetry and storytelling and art and that it's seen through this lens of Celtic culture. And of course, by today, Celtic culture has risen like the steam from Ceridwen's cauldron, and it has spread all over the world. So you have people who are learning Welsh on Duolingo and Irish on Duolingo in every part of the of, of our planet, and bringing elements of that Celtic culture to life wherever they are. So many people reach back through their ancestry to their Celtic ancestors who came from, you know, one of the six uh, Celtic nations. So I, I love that the steam of Celtica has risen and has found people to inspire all over the world who take that inspiration and bring so much joy and meaning and colour and diversity to their locales wherever they are. Uh, it's not something that has ever been in competition with anything else, but rather something that can colour different spiritual traditions and spiritual practices, which is why I often hear, you know, I have so, so, so many friends in the sisterhood of Avalon and, and they, like myself, will often refer to them as being druid adjacent. <laughs> Yes, that's what we say, yeah. druid adjacent, yes. Yes, and I know so many people who are druid adjacent because druidry in itself can can be a practice. It's something that you do. It isn't something that you necessarily believe in, but something that you actually do. Even the term druidry is a verb. So it is something that we actively do. And, and so many druids have their fingers in other pies as well, and yet they love that wisdom tradition that rises up from the forest from the grove of druidry does that answer it a little bit yeah it does <laughs> and so you just um so you said it's something that you do so in the book you say it's a call to action yes 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 very much a call to action because i think i firmly i'm I believe that Druidry is a response and primarily it's a response between the people and their land. And what I love, particularly in the, and not only in the study, but also in the utilization of mythology and storytelling and legends, is that all of those things came to us from the very earth that we stand upon. Because there's so many similarities in uh, academics might call them international motifs, but these similarities in stories and legends are uncanny. And I firmly believe that it's because we are in relationship with the earth and the earth gives us those stories. And then we color them with locality specific accoutrements and decorations and language and art and style and song and dance and music. So Druidry, is something that came from from this land it rose up from this land and touched the hearts of the people that lived here and it went to sleep for a while when the romans came and it slept for a little bit longer after they left and then it rose again the first first little tickles of it with the welsh bardic tradition and then by the time we got to the 16 and 1700s it exploded all over England, Ireland, and Northern Europe. And again, I think it was because it is in response to the very song that's inherent within the land. And that druidry itself and the, the awen that flows through it is a song that sings of that connection, of that longing, or that hiraith, as we would say in Welsh, that we all have to the land, that we're not just in relationship with it, it is also in relationship with us. You know, it's a two-way thing. And, and I love that Druidry is a language that I use to speak with the non-human aspect of the world that I live in. That's beautiful. Um, just to step back once for one second. So you, you grew up in Wales. So how would, how would you say that growing up in Anglesey of, of all places helped to shape you and bring you to this understanding of Druidry and how it called to you and I mean obviously this is a lifelong love oh yes totally to absolutely a lifelong love 
the the remarkable thing about living in Wales is that Druidry in Wales, and this is this is a really peculiar statement that many people might not expect in this conversation. But Druidry in Wales is endemic. It is it is it is fused into the very fabric of our culture and has been for so many centuries. So as you said at the beginning, I've just been um the Welsh word for it is irdo, or to be irdod, and it doesn't really translate into English. It might mean an induction, but the closest word in English that you could get to being irdod is, to, is ennoblement. It's about the closest we can get to it in the English language. So I was um, ennobled, inducted into the goddess of bards of the islands of Britain, which is a cast of druids wearing white, blue or green gowns uh, led by an arch druid. And, and what I love, and there was a beautiful meme that recently flooded through social media. Uh, a person had been observing the National Eisteddfod of Wales, which was on a couple of weeks ago, and that's where I had I was inducted into the Godset of Bards, which is the endemic cultural face of Druidry here in Wales. And and this gentleman made the most beautiful remark as to how in so many cultures people receive medals by their society, by their culture, for being military commanders or for their, their efforts in war or their political drives and ambitions. But in Wales, the highest accolade given by the country to its people is given to the best poet. You know, and it's a poet that receives the crown of our culture or the chair of our culture. And I love that because I think it's so aspirational and so beautiful that the, that the highest award you can have in Wales is because you've written a really good poet, a really good poem in like 250 <laughs> lines, you know? So, so that... People. I mean, that says a lot about your people and your culture that it's not that military knowledge or whatever but it's something so something so personal and peaceful you know? yes it, it yes that's that just so much about it and it has awen flowing through it and awen awen is such a beautiful word in that simplistically it means blessed holy breath and that it's the actual breath of the universe blowing through everything and everybody. And when we feel that, really feel it, we become co-creators with the universe itself as the Awen blows through us. And that's so much a part of the fabric of the endemic form of druidry that I have in my culture. And that I've seen, you know, since I was a tiny, tiny little thing, first able to articulate what the National Eisteddfod and the Godset of Bards were, and then competing in it as a child, and then growing up loving this beautiful bubble of poetry, bardism, of Awen that I get to enjoy every August. And so it was always there. There was always this rumbling in the background of something that was special and something that was magical. And I used to have, right, oh, I just love her memory. Um, I used to have a teacher in school called Mrs. Griffiths. And Mrs. Griffiths was just the most delightful teacher one could ever possibly wish to meet. She looked like Mother Earth. She reminds me of a Welsh version of Selena Fox. You know Selena Fox? She reminds me of so much of her. She was as round as the earth was. She had the largest pendulous bosoms ever seen in pagandom. And she would sit in her classroom and she would perch a book upon her bosom and she would read us these amazing stories and legends and myths from my people, from my culture, that were full of heroes and heroines and gods and goddesses. And these were the Mabinogi and Kilch Golwen and the Lady of the Fountain and, oh, Ellen of the Ways, all of these tales. And, and I still have this memory of sitting there, absolutely adored this teacher so much. I adored her. And all of my classmates seemed a little bit bored, <laughs> you know? And yet to me, it was as if, how can I say it? It was as if I was hearing news from home, from a place that I'd never visited, but I'd never left, from a people that 
I'd never met, but who I knew intimately. I felt as if they were a part of the very fabric of who I was. And my grandparents lived in a, a little terraced house in a little village called Llamberis at the very foot of Arwydfa or Snowdon in English. And they backed onto this magical woods called Koi Doctor or um, the woods of the doctor. And I would go into the woods and I would play with these characters uh, from the Mabinogi. I'd play with Puish and Pryderi and with Shell, and I'd make spells with Gwydion and Math. And to me, they were all very real. And they were a part of, of that landscape. They were a part of the song and the story of that place. And as I grew up, I told myself, and I still tell myself, I have to remind my the cynical, you know, the cynical 52-year-old person who lives in a society, you know, that's driven by social media. Um, I have to tell that person, don't be cynical. Um, never lose sight of the fact that that woodland was full of magic and that that magic is your inheritance. Um, never, ever let it go you know don't let it diminish within you and sometimes sometimes it's hard right you know because there's life and bills and stuff happening um but i'm thankful that i've never let go of that it's always been there so that that song has always been such a colorful vibrant part of not only my life but of my culture and of my people and my ancestors and this amazing landscape that I get to call home and have to literally pinch myself every time I look out of my bedroom window. I <laughs> like, you know, that I live in a in a mythological, mythical landscape. So it was always there. It always called to me. And, and yet we were a relatively, not so much nowadays perhaps, but we were a relatively Christian society so the only form of spiritual expression that was open to me generally was Christianity and I tried that and I gave it fair play you know I thought I'm gonna have a go because we've got chapels and churches and it's a part of my history but it didn't sing to my it didn't sing to my spirit it didn't fill my cup if that makes sense it didn't it didn't pull at me and then one day in the very place where I was born and raised, Llamberis, the village of Llamberis. And I was on a train recently with members of the Sisterhood of Avalon going up to the summit of Urwydva, um, Snowdon. And the train passes pa passes this, this pool. A river runs from a, a glacial valley in the mountains there down into the village of Llamberis. And the river is called Avon Hoch meaning the river of the sow. But hoch in Welsh is different to just a secular sow. Um, a hoch is something that is sacred. And one of those pools is called Push Morwin, or the pool of the maiden. And that's where I received my moment of wild awakening, where something within the landscape itself reached out and touched me, and I could never, ever be the same again. I saw the world through very different eyes and and it wasn't the the religion that came via Rome, you know, via the Mediterranean, via Israel that sang to me. It was something that was in the very soil of of my land itself. And and my hands were in the soil. And I remember, oh God's God's know that I cannot for the life of me recall where I heard it from. But I remember sitting listening to somebody give a talk years ago, and they said that soil is the digested wisdom of all beings. And that's always stuck with me. I love that so much. And, oh, I wish I could remember, you know, but damn my 52-year-old brain. And, um, and at that moment, I felt that wisdom. And I went looking, I went looking and said, okay, so why, why does my culture have all of these poets? And why do we have all of these myths? And what do they mean? What do they tell me about me? Um, why is my landscape littered, literally littered with ancient monuments from the late Neolithic period, all the way up to the Bronze Age period, into the Iron Age period? Why are they here? What on earth were my ancestors doing? And and when you literally trip over these things, every other field, you know, 
you have to ask yourself that question of what were they doing? <laughs> you know, because there weren't that many people here back then and they were spending gods only know how many hours building these chambers and monuments and stone circles and you kind of think oh my gosh you know did they not have better stuff to do so it obviously meant something to them you know it must have meant something enormous to them so so i went scratching and then of course the endemic version of um druidry here in wales was the was the most obvious place to to look at symbolically and think what do these people represent what does this mean and and that was it i be I, I was i was headlong then into this path you know of um I, that was the time i slid into my first robe <laughs> you know, took a wand and i'm like there we go i'm going to be a druid well, I <laughs> and think, it's an ongoing I, task I, I was going to ask about the call of wild awakening because i did i did see that in the book so how old were you so I would have been around about 19, I think, you know, it was like 19, 20. It was, it was, you know, the, the tumultuous maelstrom of hormones had started to, to settle and find their feet. Oh gosh, am I just making that up? I'm sure sometimes my hormones are my undoing to this day, but, you know, <laughs> but, but it felt as if I was settling into you know, who I was, where I was, and why I was. So I was still fairly young. And I tried um, to, I, I I did give, I did give it a fair shot. I gave Christianity the fair shot that I think it deserved, because it's a part of my culture. It's a part of my history, and it deserved, you know, a, a really good look at, but it didn't sing. And of course, and I kept using that terminology as well, that it didn't sing to my soul, it didn't sing to my spirit. And then when I started to learn about the bards and the storytellers of my culture, all they did was sing. It was all held in song and in voice and in oration. And now when I listen to my bards, I'm, you know, I'm not a particularly good bard. I'm, I try and I try my best. I write books, which I suppose is bardism in a, in a particular form. Um, but when I listen to the this internal alliteration and rhyme to the englunion of the current bards and you know the 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 ancestral bards who who wrote it all down um they make my heart sing because they just like that guy who made that comment about wales gives the highest accolade to a poet there is something inherently magical i think in something that carries the wave of awen carries the wave of creativity and of creation itself and that's what sang to me and it still sings to me and and i sing back to it i'm not the best singer in the world but i'll bloody give it a good go and even when you talk about it, it looks like just looking at you it's like i'm getting goosebumps because i think you have them <laughs> you, uh, you, yes you it's like, those, look, the yeah. gooses the gooses have yeah. come and um, so, yeah, yeah, just that. Mm, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, that. that's beautiful. So, all right, so you mentioned the Mabinogian, which, um, so when I first look at Druidry, I, and that that took me by surprise when I came across it in the book, I think Druidry, I don't necessarily think connection between Druidry and the Mabinogian. I know there's a, that connection between the sisterhood and the Mabinogian, but I was somewhat, surprised to read that so how how would you connect the two i mean i know exactly our tradition and how it connects how would you connect druidry to to this the mythology and and the stories that that we read so the the amazing thing about uh the mabinogi um, that's not to suggest these are the only druid adjacent or druid related mythologies other mythologies are available within the other six celtic nations you know and can be found very easily by googling them and they're beautiful and equally as gorgeous and fabulous and inspirational but of course but i'm welsh so i i look at the mythology of my own people and the thing about mythology is that mythology is history of the heart right it's not a history that is written by the conqueror. It's written by the people in relationship with their land. 
And when we look at the Mabinogi, what we initially see is this layer of medieval courtly and social customs. And it's colored by the V's and the thou's of Lady Charlotte Guest, you know, and even the old language that's used in the original Welsh versions. But when we scratch at that syncretic layer laid down in the medieval period, what we find is that the narrative within the Mabinogi speak of a time in Welsh slash Celtic slash British history where the Romans hadn't hadn't quite arrived here. They were they were close by. And in some of them, like in the second branch of the Mabinogi, you can you can kind of tell, oh, the Romans are close. They're not too far. They're really good, but they hadn't got here. They hadn't arrived here. So even though it has this medieval um, layer, that's just a sign that these tales kept evolving and developing and changing to not only the needs of the people, but they were reflecting society at the time. And when we look at some of the, the characters within the Mabinogi, Math is, is a, as a, to all sense and purposes, a druid. Gwydion, the impossible, um, stupid, wonderful magician who again seems to epitomize what we might romantically consider to be a druid. But because they speak of a part of our culture that is really important to us, history of the heart, as in history of the heart, within them we can see the very edges of what might have been some druidic wisdom that seeped into the storytelling tradition. So that's not to say that this is a guidebook to, you know, druidry and what a druid is and how to practice druidry, but that they certainly contain echoes of a time long since past. And what they provide us is with a whole body of beings or archetypes that people might decide or might decipher or interpret as gods and goddesses. But what I love about the whole horde of gods and goddesses, and I'm very, very promiscuous with my deities, I have a lot of them. Um, what I love is, is that they're Welsh gods and goddesses, you know? So if you take, took somebody like Rhiannon, we can we can conclude and deduce that there may well have been an earlier iteration of Rhiannon in the guise of Rigatona, the great queen, and the Romans brought Epona and such. But that Rhiannon is an evolution or a development from those older beings, and she's very much Welsh. And I love that she's a Welsh goddess and it's the the Welsh who preserved that material and then turned around to the world and said, here, we have this amazing stuff. Would you like to share it? And the world has gone, oh, yes, please. You know, and that, and that Welsh goddess now very often gets on a plane with me and I said, come on, Rhiannon, we're going to New York. <laughs> you know? And she's like, yay, happy day. <laughs> and, um, and so... And she can be found in every corner of the world in which people work with these elements of the Celtic cultural continuum and are working with elements of their own sovereignty. And that this Welsh goddess has arisen from the pages of the Mabinogi and given meaning and colour to people's spiritual expressions all over the world. And I love that. I love that her horse has now galloped across the white horses of the Atlantic and she can be found in every corner of the world. I love it. Like she can be found right in front of me. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I, I keep her right there, right in front of my desk. Fabulous, um, fabulous. <laughs> well, I also have a pona, but... <laughs> So, all right, so we decided, or we talked about earlier, your natural druidry, 2007. So what was the main impetus? So you had this. Okay, it took a while to actually it did. work. So here we are in 2023, however many years later that is. Math is not my thing. So how did we get from natural druidry to the complete book of druidry? And what, what? What brought you from here to wanting to write this one as well? Was the stuff that, that you did not cover? Is it just that that intervening years that your own wisdom, your own knowledge 
that you have gained that you want to share with us or what? Yes, very much so. So I, I remember uh, very clearly the I was giving a, a workshop at Druid Camp. And back then, Druid Camp was held in a place called Dingistow in South Wales. Gorgeous, gorgeous place with a grove up on the hill, a little river running through it. It was just the the image of Druid perfection. And I'd given a workshop. So this was in 2003. And a gentleman came up to me after my talk and he said, oh, he said, I found that really fascinating. Have you ever considered writing a book? And I said, genuinely, no, I've never considered writing a book. And he said, would you like to write a book? He said, because I'll take a look at it. And my first answer to him was, don't be stupid. I'm Welsh. Like, I'm not going to write a book in English. <laughs> I don't know how to write a book in English. Because I did ask him, in what language? And he said English. I'm like, oh, <laughs> no, like, no, I don't think that's going to happen. But then when I thought about it, I thought, I might have a go because I, you know, I, I'd, I'd been identifying as a Druid for a number of years before that moment happened. So I sat down and pondered and I wrote some words and it was terrible and the inner saboteur within me just took to hiding under the duvet with a bottle of ember cream and a huge bar of chocolate for several days at a time. Oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. You know, so I had, to, I had to fight with myself for nearly two years until I completed a manuscript in 2005 and sent it to this guy called Tom from Thoth Publications. And um, so I kind of got over myself at that point. You know, and thought, well, I'll have a go. I can speak English, you know, so surely I can write in English. And so he decided to publish it. But at the same time, it took him nearly two years to bring the book out, which is a rather long time. So the book came out, I think, 2006, 2007. So, but it had been four years in the making. So that was exactly 20 years ago when that moment happened. And what I love about the Druid tradition is that you never cease to grow and you never cease to develop or cease to find the nuggets of wisdom within your own life and within the communities that we share this tradition with. So I was I was fortunate to have had that opportunity to put those initial thoughts down. And now when I look back at it, well, even when the book came out, I'd already grown by a couple of years. And now nearly 20 years on, I felt as if I had something more comprehensive to say and maybe something a little bit more articulate. And particularly since the book of, um, since the Natural Druidry, I also learned the rules of paragraphing, which is kind of helpful when you're writing a book, you know? So I didn't know, I didn't know how to write a book. No, I had no idea. I just thought I'd write my thoughts. And 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 in a way, natural druidry is very much my thoughts at the time. So I really treasure it now because when I look back at natural druidry, I can see my life back then 20 years ago. So I can see how I've grown and how I've developed. That's not to say that I've suddenly stopped growing. And I imagine that in 20 years time, you know, if I'm still around, um, I might write another book that might be again, very different to the book of druidry. Because within that tradition and within the perpetual quest for wisdom, we're constantly growing and changing and being transformed by the processes of our spirituality and their expression. So I, I funnily enough, um, of all the books that I've written, I think um, this one is the one that I'm the most proud of. Plug, 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 available for 20 of your finest dollars, wherever you are <laughs> in the world. And um, but the one, but I really like this one, <laughs> and um, which is a really queer thing to say because most authors really struggle with what they've written, and um, and and I'm the, not the most confident of authors in the world, but I really like it because somehow it captures not only a sense of what I love the most, which is of course my druidry, um, I get to share that with the world. And I always have to pinch myself that 
I have an editor. Her name is Alicia. She works at Llewellyn Worldwide. And um, and she asks me to write books. And, and I'll never, ever get over that. And I get to share this stuff that brings to my life so much joy and inspiration and magic. And I can share that with you because you've got a copy of that book on your table, you know, and yes, with other I, people who read it. I have copies of all your books. So. <laughs> oh, thank you. And your Celtic tarot. So, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah. And everyone, you know, that's, that's starting to comment. Everyone loved Caridwin. Oh, thank you. Thank that's you so a, much. A wonderful, wonderful and everyone... book. And, you know, I don't, we, we did have you, we decided 2021 you came and you did share. It was, yes. Because Caridwin, um, Caridwin has been a part, such a, a, such a huge influential part of my life from when I was a child, absolutely and utterly in love with the story of Kiri Dwen, Guillaume Bach and Taliesin. And it was my favourite, favourite story as a child. And then I got to grow up and live the mythological landscape of that and connect to these beings that inhabit that mythological landscape. And, and I still have to pinch myself. And so she, I've had this amazing inspirational love affair with this amazing divine being who rose up out of the song of this land and through the, the the voices and across the lips of my ancestors and to be able to share that and my druidry in these funny little books that I write is such a joy and that people read them is even more of a joy and um and I think in all of the the books that I've written what I've always wanted people to feel is that I deeply, deeply, deeply love this stuff. And that I just want to almost say, look, look what I do and you can do it. And it's amazing. <laughs> and it'll, it'll change your life and it'll bring so much joy to you and transform your anxieties. And, um, and that's always been my goal. I think with, with all of my books is to imbibe other people with the same Joy. I'm, I'm. I'm using the word joy, and my brain is screaming um, to use the word shawen. Shawen is the Welsh word for joy, and to be shawenif um, is to be in a state of joy. Shawen. So my brain is screaming. It's. I'm full of shawen. You know, full of this joy, this merry merriment that comes from um, from being a druid and and writing books about it, and I think. That a job, the job of any druid is to inspire, is to inspire the world around them. And to have that opportunity to be able to share that inspiration through books is something that I will never, ever, ever take for granted. I feel very humbled and um, very, very lucky that somebody decided to give a non-English speaker, a, a non, you know, a, a a second language English speaker, the opportunity to write books and share what they love. And I will always be grateful to, you know, my initial publisher and to Llewellyn for giving me that chance, you know? So the book of Druidry is, is, is different from natural Druidry, but I think it's only different in that it's a picture of um, this Druid mm -hmm. in 2023. And that one was a picture of that Druid in 2003 up till like 2005 and so i consider it now to almost be like like a diary you know uh, the the books and that's the same i think i know i know a lot of authors now and and when i read some of their earlier works i, I can i can see the same sentiment you know you can see who they were and what they were doing at that point in their lives well the joy does come through either in reading your words or just listening to you i mean I'm picking, I can pick up every bit of joy that's coming off of you talking about Georgery and writing and, and how much you love it. One thing I really liked in, in, in the, the new book is uh, that you leave space for journaling right in the book. Yeah. <laughs> when I got to that, I was like, oh, thank God. It's, because usually you have your book and then here's your journal. And I have journals piled, piled up. <laughs> 
So I like the fact that as I'm reading this, I can journal as I'm going along. And like you said, you asked the same question at the beginning and you're going to ask the same because as you said, the difference between natural Druidry and this, we're going to see a difference between answering that question at the beginning of the book and answering that same yeah. question. Yeah. <laughs> And and I think that's wonderful. Oh um, yeah, and 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 you know it was. Uh, oh sorry, sorry. Did I interrupt you then? Sorry. Oh, fine, fine. Go ahead. Um, I I'm a huge fan of marginalia. I love marginalia. So so I don't know um, if everyone's familiar with that term, but marginalia is when somebody has made notes in the margins of books and manuscripts. And um, so so I have um, all manners. I don't have one to hand. No, um, all manners of old, old Welsh books on the Welsh Bardic tradition and mythology. And almost all of them have these marginalia. They've got these notes written in, in very, very small, small handwriting. And I've learned so much and gained so much insight from these tiny little scribbles in manuscripts and books. And and I do exactly the same. So um, my my partner, Ian, he calls me the destroyer of books because I tend to immediately break its spine <laughs> So, and I write <laughs> notes in it. I'm the folder of pages because I love them. I love them so much. And I was using one book at the Anglesey Druid Order's school uh, this previous weekend um, called The Four Branches of the Mabinogi by Will Parker. Highly recommended. Amazing, amazing book. And I opened it and it fell apart. It just fell apart. <laughs> you know. And I just have to keep taping the pages back together. But that book and me my gods we've been on adventures you know we've had such amazing times together so i i know what every coffee stain means <laughs> you could use it as a form of divination i think the the, <laughs> the horrendous state of that book and um so i'm constantly writing notes in books and so whilst i was writing the book of druidry i have um, a huge journal a really big journal where i blueprint the book but i also use that as not only a way to long hand is that the right word to long hand write some of the manuscript but i'm also scribbling notes all over it so i asked my editor i said is there any way we can just put spaces in the book so that people can write in it because that's what i love to do and she said, yes, of course we can. I thought, yes. <laughs> I, I, thought, That's I, lovely. I, I really like that idea because I, I lose track of what I'm writing, journaling from different books because the books are in one place, the journals in another. Yeah. <laughs> and I love this, that I know that in some point when I go back to this book, I'm going to be able to look at it and everything I feel and think is is going to is going to be right there. Exactly. And you know, in in like what will be amazing, right? In 80 years' time, um, when we're long gone, somebody will find your copy of the Book of Druidry in a second-hand bookshop somewhere, and it'll be full of marginalia. You know, and they'll be like... I never thought about that. You know, isn't that, isn't that just amazing? So then we become, you know, we become then the ancestors to those people in the future who are going to find these books. And I think if if one encourages, like I did, to for people to actually write in them, there'll be this lovely record. And and whilst I was thinking, oh, it'll be really useful for the reader, I was also because Druidry has this peculiar component or or almost an obsession about seeding the future with wisdom. And that's part of our jobs, you know, part of the doing of Druidry is to seed the future with a wisdom that is um a reflection of of our wisdom and and of course books do that and marginalia does that and notes do that so um so yeah you know your copy my copy who knows who will find those in a hundred years time and think oh you know look at what this person wrote and and see that's just a wonderful way of looking at it because you realize that there are people out there knowing that the fact that you write in books or you bookmark them they want to arrest you and throw you in book jail. <laughs> they do. I have some <laughs> friends that are like that. <laughs> and, you know, one of my... forth a little bit. Um, <laughs> one of my friends <laughs> shouted at me recently, um, shouted, did I just hear you break the spine of a book? I'm like, yeah, you did. Sorry. <laughs> and they cringe <laughs> in the other room. <laughs> um, I would like to open up... Um, 
for questions. But before I do, we did have one question from the beginning before we quite started. So you know, you know all about Georgia. You know a lot about us and the sisterhood. For us sisters who want to combine them, how can we add aspects of Druidry into our daily Avalonian practice? So um, I think that question has two, two possible answers. One is metaphorical and the other one is practical. Uh, on a metaphorical level, it's the incorpor it's the incorporation of wisdom, uh, not only into to enrich the individual's life, but also to enrich the lives of those people around them. But I know that in the Sisterhood of Avalon, the dissemination of wisdom is already something that is encouraged and something that happens. So on a practical level, I'd go back immediately. I always go back to the factory setting of what a druid means. Somebody who knows the trees, somebody who is oak wise or strives to be oak wise. And the way that I incorporated druidry into my very early pagan practices, because I wasn't really sure if I, if what I was had a title as such, but I knew that druids were part of my culture and I wanted somehow to incorporate elements of that into the exploratory stages of my own spirituality and the way I did that was with trees and I built and developed a relationship initially with a mountain ash with a with a rowan tree and I still have a rowan tree in the garden that I grew from sapling from seed and she's 23 years old now and we have a relationship and that tree taught me so much, not only about the very land that she lived and the idiosyncrasies of that landscape, but she also taught me something about myself. So I have a wand, a rowan wand, you know, that comes from, from that original tree that I first fell in relationship with. I went back and visited that tree about 10 years later and and I found that a branch had fallen in a previous storm and it was as if it was a gift from her. So I started incorporating the wisdom of Rowan and it was just Rowan. I didn't baffle or bewilder myself with, you know, a whole Oum alphabet or a whole horde or an army of trees. I started with one tree and incorporated that into my practice and started telling the story of the wisdom that came from that connection. And suddenly... And this is probably a very subjective thing to say. Um, I started to feel like a druid because I was in relationship with one of the primary teachers of the druid tradition with a tree. So, so I would say it's develop a relationship with a tree that is real and practical and incorporate the virtues of that tree and its wisdom into your everyday life and also into your spirituality and the community thereof. And, um, and then write a bit of poetry. I'm really bad at poetry. <laughs> I try so hard. <laughs> I, I, I write poetry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I still I still try. So so I have this practice. Um so every Sunday, so I'll be doing it later on today. Um, I write a poem to Keridwen and I do my Sunday devotionals to Keridwen on a Sunday evening and I write her a poem and some, sometimes they're really bad poetry but I think she really appreciates the effort <laughs> you know so it's like little things like that you know that we can incorporate elements that we can see that are obvious within the Druid tradition and I'm not being bewildered by all of the elements because there's all sorts like rituals and philosophy and poetry and storytelling and bardism and uh, natural sciences. You can become really bewildered. So I just focused on one thing, a tree. And then I built on that. And um, and and what the, the Rowan tree was, it was amazing because it opened so many doors because I had no idea at that point that the Rowan or the mountain ash had so much folklore associated with her so much folklore and then of course that opened another door so what I found was that by incorporating one element of something that was obviously druidic into my life it just opened all of these doors that led onto a druidic landscape that was being colored by so much that was already in my culture so so I think it's that. It's like, don't overcomplicate it. Keep it simple. 
and focus on one thing and incorporate that into your practice and um you know and read read all the books that there are listen to the podcasts that there are from other druids and what they're doing because um we we can sometimes have a slightly different focus within our druidry and listening to those things is particularly inspirational i love a podcast you know I love a podcast. So so things like Druidcast, which is the podcast of the Order of Bards, Ovates and Druids, is really informative and really inspirational. So yeah, so that's what I would say. Build a relationship with a tree and focus on the inherent wisdom within you and how you can express that into the outside world. Excellent. Thank you, Christopher, so much. Mm. Um, so uh, everyone, um, before we end, uh, if you have any questions and you'd like to pop them in the chat oh i haven't even opened the chat because i find if i do i'll go over there and read them all <laughs> <laughs> every <there's laughs> comments about everything that we've been talking about not a lot of questions I um, I I i'd like to open up now if anyone who has a question oh there's a lot of comments yes and i know jenna's here now so maybe she has a question she was here not that long ago oh yeah <laughs> Okay, um, <laughs> Tiffany, how might someone outside of Wales connect with the essence of the coracle, which is beautifully and uniquely Welsh? Does she mean the coracle as in the vessel that's on water? I'm assuming she is. I don't think she means me. <laughs> <laughs> so... I mean, I wouldn't say that it's uniquely Welsh because the other Celtic um, lands and nations also used coracles uh, physically for, you know, fishing and such. But, oh, I see, she means as a, as a concept overall. Um, essentially, the, the coracle is a vessel that carries us from one experience to another. So when we look at the tale of Cedidwen and Taliesin, the really interesting thing that happens at the point just prior to the, the young baby being placed in a coracle was that there, there's, um, there's a point of crisis that happens within the birthing of the child and also to Keridwen herself, who were up to that point through the chase and through her pregnancy, is intent on the murder of this child. She's going, she's going to slaughter it. And in that moment of birthing, even the goddess herself has this moment of atonement, of a deeper understanding. And, and what I love about that is that in Celtic mythology, in the Druid tradition, even our gods are not infallible, that all of our gods also have a fallibility. And I think that makes them wonderfully um, relatable, that we can relate to the fact that even they can sometimes express flaws and that they can make up for those flaws. So the child is placed in a coracle and is sent for 80 years down uh, the river between worlds until the child is birthed in almost a very visceral cesarean section type scene at the salmon weir of Gwyddenot Garan here at Kalangayav on the eve of Halloween. And um, and I think what to, to me what the coracle represents is an isolation and a separation that is almost tantamount to death but nobody dies uh, the person is being transformed and is assimilating the mysteries um, given to them by the process of the chase with Keridwen and that the coracle acts as a secondary gestationary vessel a little bit like the chest that we see in the fourth branch of the Mabinogi where the small thing that Arianrod, Aranrod drops from her womb, and it's just described as a thing, a pethan, is then placed by Gwydion into this other secondary gestational vessel, the kist at the bottom of the bed. And um, and uh, a process of isolation, separation, and assimilation happens within that vessel. So I think that's what the coracle represents in my um, journey with the the initiatory component of the Keridwen and Taliesin story is that when we undergo 
a process of spiritual inspiration or teachings, or even if it's just embarking on a course or something, that it's really important at the end of it that we isolate ourselves, that we we coracle ourselves, that we place ourselves in a place in which we can withdraw and assimilate and allow the catharsis of that experience to transform us. Otherwise, we just go straight to Tesco's to do our weekly shopping. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, something amazing has just happened. I need to take, whether it's a day off or a few hours, or, you know, or if you're like me, go to Bardsey Island for a week by yourself or go to Finland for three weeks by yourself, you know, to assimilate. So to me, the forced or the enforced isolation that I put myself through is a version of the coracle, is placing myself in that coracle in order to assimilate what experiences I've had in order that I can be transformed by it in a way that that road back, that bringing back the elixir of the goddess, if you like, is then done in a way that I understand and I know what the word, what the world needs from me, um, rather than floundering in the dark. And I think that's the the function of the corrigal is the integration of that experience into a reality that is apparent and tangible in the real world. That was love. Um, Tiffany is also asking, what other podcasts do you recommend? Oh, my gosh. So um, I'm a huge podcast fan. So um, I listen to, oh, gosh, I listen to, hold on, hold on. It's it's, it's, it's here on my computer because I've been listening to it this morning, um, which I just love. The Blind Boy podcast. Um, so the Blind Boy podcast podcast is from Ireland and this or not this week two weeks ago it was um, mythology rewilding forests and indigenous knowledge with Marshan uh, McGann so the blind boy podcast is really really good um, the other one that I really love is the emerald and the emerald is a deep dive into mythological concepts and studies in a way that I have never encountered before. Um, the guy's voice is beautiful and soothing, but it's so epically poetic. It's epically poetic. And that podcast is pretty intense. I can't listen to it in one go. I have to digest. I have to assimilate what he said and really re-listen. So every single episode of The Emerald... I might listen to them. Well, I, I think I've, there's one in particular that I know that I've listened to over a dozen times to just assimilate the the wisdom that's inherent within it. Uh, and Druid cast, of course, and probably a horde of others as well that I probably can't um, recall off the top of my head. But those are my favourites: is um, the Emerald Druid cast, the Blind Boy podcast, and my. Um, and I think the one that I love the most, which which actually doesn't have anything to do with my druidry, but I do consider it to be adjacent, is, is a, a podcast called Grief Cast. Because I worked for 32 years as a death service professional. Okay. And whilst uh, the death service professional of um, um, parts of my life um, has now come to an end, I've retired from that, Um it was something that informed my druidry, you know, working with the dead and the dying and the bereaved was something that was adjacent to my druidry and it informed it. Um, so grief cast is one that I still love because it, it reminds me of that element of my life, that part of my life that I value. And also there's wisdom in it. So I think anything that gives us, provides us with nuggets of wisdom is valuable, you know, whether it's druidry or druid adjacent. So we have, um, what would you say is the difference between Awen and Imbas? Are we Nothing. going astray when we translate them both as simply inspiration? Um, so so even when we translate Awen and Imbas as inspiration, um, it's an easy catch-all phrase, but we also do it a little bit of disservice because it isn't just inspiration. It's something significantly more than just a state of inspiration. Uh, not only is Awen the blessed holy breath of the universe itself that blows through us, we have a duty upon 
integrating that blowing the breath of Awen through us and into the world that if we're inspired we have a duty to to share that inspiration with the rest of the world and with the people around us um creating that dti i mentioned flippantly earlier on the druid transmitted infection and um so that so awen and imma so the same thing it's just uh different languages to express the similar concept um that it's this it's being co-creators with the universe it's not just about being inspirational or inspiring somebody else. It's about understanding that we're an extension of the same force that gave rise to stellar nurseries and planets and stars and nebulae, um, blades of grass and trees and rivers and salmons, that we're we're the same extension as that energy. And, um, and I love that whether you call it Immas, and I'm sure there are other names in other cultures to express a similar concept um or awen it's more than just the power of inspiration even though inspiration is very much a part of its essence um it's also more than that it's about co-creating with the universe so let's do one more last question before before we end for today so um sharon says you started out talking about the importance of the oak tree specifically and plants in general to Druidry, with the tree being a doorway between worlds. Do you perceive non-human animals as being a component of or relevant to Druidry? Yes, very, 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 very much so. So wisdom can come from any part of our of our world, not just from the human world. And whilst um, I very much focus on trees, um, evidently just because of the name Druid, you know, and this association that we have with, with trees. But when we look in the Welsh Bardic tradition, when we look in the Welsh storytelling tradition, and the same as well in all of the other Celtic nations and cultures, uh, animals play a really important role in the transmission and dissemination of wisdom. So I think that whenever we look into, into mythology, so take, for instance, the tale of Ceridwen and Taliesin, there's a huge chunk in the middle where the zoomorphic qualities of the world are trying to tell us something in Ceridwen changing into a greyhound, Gwion into a hare, an otter and a salmon, the black crested hen. If we look in the tale of Kilo Chagolwen, we meet the oldest animals of the world, you know, the oldest animals, and they have this wisdom to teach us and to share with us that we're all, we're all in this world and on this world and within the fabric of this world together. And we're not isolated or exist in a vacuum. The trees are trying to teach us something, but so are the animals, but so are the mountains and the, and the, and the oceans and the insects and the, the flowers. All of them have something to share. And that animistic quality within the apparent world is a source of profound wisdom. So, so yes, very much so. As soon as you start looking into any of the um, Celtic bodies of mythology, you immediately start seeing animals. And when we look and work with them closely and study them and fall into relationship with them, we glean immense wisdom about who we are and also who we are in relation to them and what message that that relationship can give us, how it can transform us and how we can share that meaningfully with the world. Yes, animals all the way. Thank you, Christopher. Um, I can't tell you how happy I am to have spent this past hour or so chatting with you. And is it an hour? And we're actually a little over an hour. Oh yeah. my word! Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, before before we really say goodbye, I just would like to uh, let everyone know that Cork is back. And our next Coracle Live interview, I believe, is um, shoot, Friday night, September 15th. We're kicking off a ninefold weekend with an interview with Jenna to discuss her new book um, on the ninefold path, which also is excellent. I have all these books piled up next, next to my bed, and it's like, okay, which one do I do for now? 
And um, and also for those of you who have just loved this chat with Christopher, he will be back on Saturday, October 26th with a two hour workshop on a Wednesday. Two hours thereabouts. Is it the 21st? The 21st or 26th? I'm sorry. 21st. I getting those confused. 21st. When you said 26th, okay. then my heart sank because I'll be in Mexico. Okay. No, there it is. Okay. It's one o'clock <laughs> noon, uh, Eastern time. Um, yes. So, so come back for that, uh, that we'll be starting to post that, uh, within the next, um, probably few days so that you can sign up through that, uh, for that through Eventbrite. And we get to spend another glorious afternoon listening to Christopher. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. I can I can just see some of the messages there. Thank you so much for yes. all your lovely, lovely, lovely messages. I appreciate all of them very much. Thank you. Thank you for taking time to write and to listen to my my little ramblings. It's been it's been a joy. It really has. And it's nice to see you again. And I look forward to seeing you in a couple of months. Yes, Thank you ever so much. Thanks, okay. everybody. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you.